Ten seconds, Super. Kiss my hot leg. I want you to hold it between your knees. There's never a cop around when you need one. You got a little pretty male thing. Well, do you, punk? I'm gonna nail you for picking your feet and fucking up. This cat shaft is a bad mother. Shut your mouth. Welcome to Vintage Video's 12 Days of Christmas, where as a special treat this year, we'll be reviewing all our Patreon poll options for December of 1973, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jess Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 50th anniversary of the release of The Wicker Man on December 6th, 1973. It was written by Anthony Schaefer, based on the novel by David Pinner, directed by Robin Hardy, and released by British Lion Films. I should mention that novel is actually called Ritual. So different title uh-huh. and technically very loose adaptation. So uh-huh. not technically based on the novel. I was going to say that's a very uninteresting title. Yeah. In 1967, Pinner's novel Ritual was published. It tells the story of a British police officer sent to a small Cornish village to investigate the alleged ritualistic murder of a young girl. As in the film, the locals are uncooperative and the man is forced to unravel the mystery alone. The novel was adapted into a screenplay by Paul Meyersberg and set to be directed by Michael Winner with John Hurt in the lead, but director Winner's departure from the project paused the development. Around this time, Christopher Lee was growing weary of appearing in zero-budget Dracula films four times a year for Hammer and Amicus, and forged a partnership with screenwriter Anthony Schaefer intending to develop more original and substantial film projects. After reading Pinner's novel, Schaefer and Lee together bought the rights to the story and brought it to Peter Snell's British Lion films before attaching Robin Hardy to direct. Using the same general concept, a very loose screenplay adaptation was composed. In researching old religious sacrifice traditions, Schaefer came across an illustration of a wicker man, which was said to have been constructed by ancient settlements and packed with live sacrifices, both animal and human, though most historians doubt that humans were ever actually victims of these ceremonies. The only existing descriptions of the wicker man tradition come from Julius Caesar's commentaries on the Gallic War, and it's possible that they were fabricated to make their opponents seem more barbaric. Do you guys recall the last time we mentioned Caesar's Gallic Wars? Oh, crap. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, God. Uh, neighbors. That's right. Because it's pizza. No, spaghetti. Italian food. <laughs> it was parodied as a Italian restaurant. They don't have their sign up yet, but it's got a cute name. Caesar's Garlic Wars. <laughs> Schaefer expanded on Pinner's story by weaving in many ancient pagan traditions in place of the novel's more satanic focus. A limited budget meant the cast were expected to perform for far less than their typical rate. Christopher Lee was the first slotted into the cast and agreed to perform for free as the ominous Lord Summerisle, and he had pushed for his regular Hammer collaborator Peter Cushing to play the part of Sergeant Howie, but scheduling problems passed the part along to Michael York and then David Hemmings on the way to producer Snell's first choice, Edward Woodward. I, I I like a lot of these casting choice ideas. I think John Hurt would have been amazing. Not yes. that I don't yeah. love what you know what was done here. I'm just saying that uh, I think John Hurt could have done great, and Michael York would have been perfect. I could see him in that role too. I think Peter Cushing is an odd choice for. I mean, he he probably would have been fifty something, mm. and to be playing a a, a virgin police officer going <laughs> yeah, to this yeah, island yeah. Fair. is a strange choice. <laughs> he also probably was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> Chris, how much did you say this pays? <laughs> literally nothing. It was like, yeah, oh, shoot, I got stuff that week. Doing this other movie, uh, the Star something. something. <laughs> Screenwriter Schaefer saw Oscar nominee Diane Salento on stage and coaxed her out of retirement to play the schoolmistress. She was married at the time to actor Sean Connery, but bonded tightly with Schaefer over the course of this production, and the two were married 12 years later. Distributor British Lion Films was unexpectedly bought out by a man named John Bentley, who rushed Wicker Man into production to calm the nerves of union heads who suspected he intended to strip the company for parts. British Lion Films' new manager, Michael Dealey, clashed regularly with the production, recommending a happier ending that we'll discuss at the end, and ultimately expressing a severe disappointment in the theatrical cut. What? Yeah, he was very disappointed in the film oh my gosh i feel like anybody that came out of this project could have been like i accidentally mm-hmm. just bought something awesome yeah <laughs> d lee told christopher lee that he ranked the wicker man among the bottom 10 films of all time 
though until his death Lee has asserted The Wicker Man to be his best work. The original theatrical release was 87 minutes long, but that's not what we watched. The first cut was 99 minutes, but at the recommendation of American film producer Roger Corman, about 13 minutes were removed. But the 99-minute version is not what we watched either. Wait, what did we watch? <laughs> Director Robin Hardy had maintained a print of his own 96-minute cut of the film, and though Corman's copy of the 99-minute cut was lost, it survived as a videotape telecine transfer. Hardy and Corman's extended cuts were edited together, into what was marketed as the director's cut, which unfortunately has a few very low quality sequences owing to the inclusion of videotape material. But even that is not the cut that we'll be discussing today. What we watched is called the final cut, and it includes that footage along with missing material that was dug up in a Harvard film archive in 2013. Huh. So it's the latest version so of the film. We, we watched the most complete version out there. Yes, okay. and, it, and it's a beautiful 4K release that yeah. just came out. The Wicker Man film was followed by a novelization co-written by director Hardy and screenwriter Schaefer, despite the film being semi-adapted from an existing mm -hmm. novel. So they wrote a book called <laughs> The Wicker Man, even though The Wicker Man was based on a different book. In the wake of the film's popularity, Penner actually wrote a sequel to his source material, Ritual, entitled The Wicca Woman, returning to Summer Isle 30 years later with a new mystery. The titular Wicker Man has also been an inspiration for the effigy typically set ablaze at the center of the annual Burning Man Festival in the U.S., though they deny any connection. Mm. It's like, oh, no, that's just the thing that people used to do. And it's like, oh, where'd you hear about it? Yeah. The, the Wicker Man movie. <laughs> Screenwriter Schaefer also composed a treatment for a direct sequel entitled The Loathsome Lambton Worm, which was never produced as a film, but was performed as a table read and recorded as a full cast audio play that's easy enough to find on YouTube. I listened to it this week, and we'll discuss the plot of that unproduced second chapter at the end. In 2006, a remake directed by Neil LeBute and starring Nicolas Cage and Ellen Burstyn was released, and we'll discuss some changes for that at the end as well. The DVD commentary track for the 1973 Wicker Man is actually amazing. It features the voices of director Hardy, Edward Woodward, and Christopher Lee, and in that, Lee mentions that he was in discussions with the studio about appearing for a cameo in the 2006 remake, but that didn't end up happening. In 2011, the original Wicker Man director, Robin Hardy, returned to the franchise with a spiritual sequel entitled The Wicker Tree, which he wrote himself based on his own novel entitled Cowboys for Christ. What? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what it's called. I feel like we need to start this sentence over. What is happening? <laughs> Robin Hardy, who directed the 73 film, mm -hmm. wrote a sequel, sort of sequel novel called Cowboys for Christ that tackles a lot of the same themes as the original Wicker Man film. And then he adapted it into a screenplay and shot it as a film. It also features a short cameo from Christopher Lee, but not reprising the Lord Summer Isle character. There's no direct connection to the previous film. I don't under Cowboys for Christ. Cowboys for Christ. It'll make more sense at the end when I explain the plot of the Wicker Tree. <laughs> <laughs> that is also I, a I, terrible title. <laughs> I, I really just wanted to be guys in like cow costumes. It's like literally the exact same story, but it's shaped <laughs> like a tree and not a man. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> There's no cowboys. A shorter version of the film starts with the message, The producer would like to thank the Lord Summer Isle and the people of his island off the west coast of Scotland for this privileged insight into their religious practices and for their generous cooperation in the making of this film. To imply some kind of a basis in reality. I love it. It's like um, Blair Witch before Blair Witch. Yeah, or, or Fargo <laughs> even. Wait, did Fargo have something? At the beginning it says based on a true story and it's not. Oh, that's funny. A wood carving of the face of a sun god we'll come to know as Nuada slides out of blackness to fill the screen, and we cut to Sunday, the 29th of April, 1973, in a church. Edward Woodward, as Sergeant Howie, stands at the front of the church, singing The Lord's My Shepherd, and then reading to the congregation. Now, in other versions, the, the only scene that we're missing, other than that early disclaimer, is there's also another scene where we see Edward Woodward at the police station, talking to another police officer about how he's received this message and he's going to the island and they make fun of him for being a virgin. And that's because that's okay. he's about to get married and they're like, oh, your wife's going to spend all of her time on her knees, but in a church, not blowing you like she wants to be doing. <laughs> but that's that's the original scene that, that got cut out here. Everything else, I think this the cut that we watched is the fullest version of the story. That's the only scene that's missing from this. But he does tell somebody that he's leaving to go to this... Right. island because he got this message yeah and there was also 
somewhere in the story there's a monologue about the apples of the island Mm -hmm. uh that's told by christopher lee and that scene has never been recovered in any form but that was like his favorite part of the movie so he's the most devastated that that never showed up because his whole life he kept saying someone's going to find that and they're going to cut it in and it's going to be great and nobody ever found it we dip to black and transition to a seaplane taking off from the water sergeant howie is the pilot and he flies over a collection of small islands so i immediately have a lot of questions <laughs> yeah. about his skill set and the police's involvement into this in that they sent one guy. They sent one guy, but they allowed him to take their seaplane to go and investigate this without any supervision or communication or backup or yep. because without that scene, like you like you mentioned, there's no scene. It's like I don't know. This guy must be really important. Yeah, it 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 does leave you kind of contextless. And also, I feel like taking out that police station scene makes you not know what time you're in, mm-hmm. other than like the general modernity of his uniform when he gets to the island like this could take place you know 50 years ago 70 years ago i have no idea well i think the plane kind of places it in a certain yeah, that's time true. period that's true eventually he touches down off the coast of the island of summer isle the sergeant calls to men on shore beside a harbor master sign he asks them to send out a dinghy to his plane through a megaphone and they refuse i'm afraid it can't be done sir this is private property You can't land here without written permission. The sergeant points out his official government capacity and demands the dinghy so that he might investigate a complaint about a missing girl on the island. They send a dinghy with a painting of an evil eye on the bow and make plans to inform Lord Summer Isle at once. Amusingly, they didn't paint this eye on the boat. It was there when they found it, and they thought it was just perfectly spooky for their film. Once on shore, the sergeant presents the growing crowd of men with a photograph of the alleged missing girl, 12-year-old Rowan Morrison. They're all quick to deny ever having seen her. No, no, I've never seen her before. I don't know the face either. You're not Kenny. <coughs> she doesn't belong to this island. No, I never saw her before. No, she doesn't belong here at all, Johnny. Yeah. The sergeant is here on account of an anonymous tip, so he doesn't know who even reported the girl missing yet. He reads them the full complaint, and we learn that Rowan is supposedly the daughter of May Morrison, a name the men recognize. Oh, May Morrison. Oh, okay, sorry. Yes, I, we know the Morrisons. They point Sergeant Howie to the post office in the high street where May works. That's not May's daughter, though. No, she's not May's. Then who is she? They don't respond, and the sergeant walks to the post office. In a way, they're correct because the girl in this photograph is actually not the actress Jerry Cowper credited as Rowan in the film, but her twin sister Jackie Cowper. Oh. <laughs> Everywhere he goes, townspeople are opening windows and doors to watch him go by. When he gets there, the post office seems more than half candy shop. The shelves are loaded with big chocolate rabbits. Those are hairs. <laughs> Silly old rabbits. Lovely match hairs. Sorry, hairs. May finds him, and he tells her about the letter he got regarding her missing daughter. She doesn't recognize the girl in this photo, but she leads him through the back room to see her actual daughter, nine-year-old Myrtle, sitting at a table painting rabbits. Those are hairs. Sorry, hairs. (laughs) The sergeant is left alone with Myrtle for a moment, and he asks if she knows Rowan. She says Rowan runs around the fields before explaining that Rowan is another hare. That night, searching for a room to rent, the sergeant stops into the Green Man Inn with one of the coolest signs we've seen since the slaughtered lamb in An American Werewolf in London. The green man is a folkloric symbol of rebirth and the new growth of spring. In keeping with the sore thumb out-of-towner trope, the din of the crowded bar shrinks to a whisper as the sergeant speaks with the innkeeper. The innkeeper brings his daughter Willow, played by Britt Eklund, out to show him to his room. Her unexpected attractiveness does not go unmentioned, though. In fact, the entire crowd launches into a song about how they all want to fuck the landlord's daughter, and the father and daughter are weirdly good sports about it. And when her name is mentioned, the parts of every gentleman do stand up at attention. <laughs> oh, nothing can delight so. The part that lies between her left toe and her right toe. Eventually, the sergeant breaks up the song to remind them that he's here on official business in search of the missing girl. 
The sergeant walks around the inn looking at a collection of framed photographs, and it seems like there's an annual photo taken of a girl posing with overflowing baskets of fruits and vegetables each year. But the most recent year's photo is missing. He's Harvest Festival photographs. Aye, we have one taken at the end of every summer. It happened to last year's. Mm, it got broke. Which is doubly funny because one of the pictures on the wall from 1970 is also shattered in the frame. Mm. <laughs> so being broken is not a reason to take it down. I'm confused about this statement here. Because he says we take them at the end of every summer? Yeah. Oh, okay. So they're taken... Sorry, I was thinking that they were taken every May Day, but they're not taken on the May no. Day. They're taken at May the- Day is when they start the harvest, or mm-hmm. when they when they start planting, or no, when they start sprouting. I don't know how Earth works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's that's the start of the growing season, and in theory, at the end of summer, you know, is if they're you going harvest. into mm-hmm. fall, you know, you're harvesting everything. Okay, so the picture is taken at the end of the harvest. So in theory, this is last year's picture, right? And they are in spring. Yes. Okay. When the sergeant is finally served his meal, it looks spoiled and gross. He asks for apples, but Willow claims there are none on the island, presuming they've exported them all, even though we saw crates full of them in every framed photograph. When he leaves the bar later, the sergeant happens upon an orgy in a field in the dark, and he sees clothed villagers watering graves and naked women squatting over headstones. He retires to his room for the night. (laughs) It's like, that's it? You're good? (laughs) <laughs> like, well, Nothing that's to see here? <laughs> yeah. Everything appears to be in order. <laughs> Any of you seen this girl? <laughs> it's pretty dark out here. <laughs> in the middle of the night, he overhears a man, Lord Summerisle, offering up a boy, Ash Buchanan, as a quote-unquote sacrifice to Willow McGregor. She's flattered by the offer and invites Ash up to her room. Weirdly, Summerisle refers to Willow directly as Aphrodite, a Greek god, because why not? They like to mix it up here. <laughs> In the second story, they introduce, like, Egyptian gods, too. It's like they just worship whatever comes to mind. Enjoy yourself and him. Only make sure you are ready for tomorrow's tomorrow. The day of death and rebirth. Yes. And of a somewhat more serious offering. And tonight. The crowd in the bar seem to know what's happening in Willow's room above them and sing a song about young lovers, which was cut from the original theatrical release. This is the, the Gently Johnny song. In the bushes outside, Lord Summerisle, as played by Christopher Lee, observes snails making love on leaves. He tells us about his respect for the animals in the wild and how they don't worship higher powers or one another. Not one of them is respectable or unhappy all over the earth. This is a paraphrasing of a Walt Whitman poem, specifically Song of Myself 32. The poem's inclusion was a last-minute decision and was intended to be read verbatim, but Christopher Lee explains on the commentary track that they kind of surprised him with it right before shooting the scene. (laughs) Mr. Hardy then sprang one on me, thank you, which you will shortly be coming to. (laughs) And Robin said to me, here's this little poem by Walt Whitman. Do you think you could memorize this before it gets pitch dark? The sergeant is disturbed by Willow's moans as she has sex with a young boy in the next room over. He's disturbed by everything. He gets really upset. I feel like this is one thing that makes sense. It's like, should I be arresting her right now? (laughs) What is happening? How old is this kid? How old is this girl? (laughs) But yeah, he does. He does seem to have the same disturbed expression throughout the film. Yeah. Or even just like, like he doesn't like their singing. Like he he sees people outside having sex. It's like, he just comes in. He's like in a huff. He rips the key off the wall. And it's just like. This, you don't live here, man. <laughs> but I actually, I think you're right, though, in that I feel like he only has one, t- one like version of being upset mm. and uh, and disturbed by this stuff, where it's just like, no, I think there's different levels to yeah. this, you know. And <laughs> in the morning, we see a child throwing a wreath over the top of a maypole. The sergeant asks Willow directions to the local school. On the way, he passes children weaving ribbons around a maypole and singing a song about human reproduction. And on that bed there was a girl, and on that girl there was a man, and from that man there was a seed, and from that seed there was a boy, and from that boy there was a man. When he finds the school, he watches through the window for a moment and is annoyed to see yet another sexual discussion involving children. The teacher asks what the maypole represents, and most of the class are excited to answer. Phallic symbol. The phallic symbol. That is correct. It is the image of the penis. 
which is venerated in religions such as ours, as symbolizing the generative force in nature. The sergeant asks the teacher to step outside with him and threatens to report her to the authorities for the overt sexual nature of her lesson. She reminds him that police don't choose school curriculums. He asks her class if they know a girl named Rowan Morrison, and when they deny any knowledge, he points to an empty desk and asks whose it was. Whose desk is that? No one's. He walks to the chalkboard and just erases a huge <laughs> section of the lesson. Yeah, this guy, I I get so frustrated. It's like, is, are we supposed to like treat him as the hero? Because everything yeah. he does just really upsets me. But there's seriously like four or five lines of text that yeah. he just wipes out to write Rowan Morrison. It's like, you think they don't know the name? Yeah. You just pointed to her desk. Although what's left on the chalkboard makes it look like they're taking a class from Pomoda Sprout at Hogwarts. It's all <laughs> witchcrafty stuff. The toadstone preserves the newly born from the weir. The hagstone preserves people from nightmares, etc. He scribbles Rowan Morrison's name across the top of the board. He opens the empty desk and inside there's a beetle tied by thread to a hammered nail circling it like a miniature maypole. The little old beetle goes round and round, always the same way you see, until it ends up right up tight to the nail. Poor old thing. <laughs> He digs through the teacher's desk for the class register, and sure enough, he finds Rowan Morrison's name with the listed home address of the post office. So this is the first bit of evidence that he gets. That, that she actually existed. Yeah. Uh, with the moment he arrived and the moment he met Mae Morrison, who supposedly wrote the letter saying, no, my daughter's right here. This isn't real. He should have gone, I should probably call in. And turn and around. Say, yeah. Like everything is pointing to why, why is he so determined when everyone is telling him, no, that we don't know this person. I think he's so offended by the weirdness mm. that he's just trying to find something that he can nail them for. He calls the teacher and students out for lying to him and nobody responds or cares. Despite being a fifth or sixth grade class, one student, Daisy, played by Leslie Mackey, the one who comments on the Beatle, was actually 21 at the time of shooting this scene. Miss Rose tells the girls to continue their reading while she talks to the sergeant outside. Outside, she tries to twist the meaning of her own words by implying that because Rowan no longer exists, they can't know her. He takes her to mean that Rowan is dead, but she says they don't use that word here. What is this, wing commander? <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird reference. But I, I think they said they don't they don't use the word dead mm. in that movie. <laughs> I haven't seen it since it was in theaters. <laughs> is it the Kelrathi? Is that the... Do they don't say dead? No, the lion. That's like the lion people. I don't remember anything else oh, about okay. that movie. I think Matthew Lillard was in it. I don't, I think Mark Hamill was in some of them. Freddie Prince Jr. probably. If you got Lillard, you got Prince Jr. probably. <laughs> the teacher explains that they believe after her death that Rowan was reincarnated into the nature of their island. She tells them that the girl has been buried beside what was formerly a church but is no longer used for Christian rituals. Okay, so like at this point in the story... They're saying that she's dead. But up until this point, everyone has been like, I don't know who that is. She doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, which I think is just kind of an amazing thing to have an entire town conspire to say the same things, but then have that thing shift over time. Yeah, maybe. Like even all the kids. Like somehow the update is getting around that it's like, okay, so now he knows that she existed, but we also, uh, we told him that we buried her. So <laughs> that's the new thing. Make sure everybody knows. Yeah, but dude, like the guys unloading the boats, the kids in the school, like everyone's saying the same thing. And yeah. then, you know. It's they just... keep they keep the same inconsistent story. Yeah. All right. He, he, knows, he knows that she did exist, so... They do exist. That's my impression of Santa from that M&M's commercial. <laughs> Sergeant Howie walks the cemetery alone reading various headstones. Here lies Beach Buchanan, protected by the ejaculation of serpents. You can go ahead and put this on the list <laughs> of potential headstones for me. Okay. <laughs> protected by the ejaculation of serpents. But you have to follow through. Yeah. <laughs> you have to train those serpents well. <laughs> that goes right next to Flash Gordon's earthling executed by ming deeper in the cemetery the sergeant finds a mother breastfeeding a child with an egg in her free hand the director robin hardy has since explained that this young mother is trying to conceive again and was advised by their customs to hold an egg in the cemetery of course nearby the sergeant sees crates formerly filled with apples and now emptied he smashes the crate with his hands and uses two pieces of wood to form a cross to rechristen the cemetery yeah. which is like 
That's not these people's religion. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, my note here is Sergeant Howie defiles a gravesite. <laughs> <laughs> Edward Woodward said he returned to this cemetery decades later, and this wood cross was still here sitting on the same stone. Oh, wow. The cemetery groundskeeper pushes a lawnmower into the shot, and Sergeant Howie asks why there are trees planted on each grave. He points to the freshest one and says it is named Rowan after the girl buried here six or seven months ago. The sergeant notices something hung on a branch in the tree, and the groundskeeper explains that it's the girl's umbilical cord, as if that were an obvious thing to hang on the tree. Mm -hmm. It's like, first of all, do you just file them away to hang on the trees yeah. later? Yes, we do. Yeah. <laughs> Keep, you, you put it in a, a jar. a whole system. <laughs> we'll see one of those jars later. He asks to speak with the local minister, and the groundskeeper just laughs in his face, because they don't have one of those. I don't understand why he still thinks that they're Christian. Mm -hmm. It's also weird that Robin Hardy is credited as the minister. I guess he must be the guy in the church scene at the beginning. Right, of right. The sergeant returns to the post office and watches through a doorway as Mae Morrison cures her daughter's sore throat by briefly placing a live frog in her mouth. That ought to do it. Thanks very much, Ray. When she finally notices the sergeant standing there, she asks if she can help him, as if this were a normal situation to walk into. Oh, I doubt it. Seeing it all raving mad. <laughs> it's pulling no punches now. The sergeant heads to the registrar's office for an official list of deaths recorded on the island. The woman in the office refuses to show him any documentation without Lord Summerisle's permission. He threatens her with an immediate arrest if she doesn't cooperate. After looking at the paperwork, the sergeant deduces that Rowan's death was not recorded and never reported. And while the woman in this office recognizes the girl from her picture, she refuses to divulge the cause of death. At the next quaint little shop he stops into, we see a one-gallon jar of foreskins and a two-headed kitten floating in formaldehyde. He's here to meet with Mr. Lennox, who takes the annual Harvest Festival photograph. He mentions the allegedly broken photograph of the latest Harvest Festival and asks if he can see a copy of the picture. He shows Lennox the photograph of Rowan and asks if this is the girl from the latest picture, but the man won't give the sergeant a straight answer. We cut to a field of blossoming fruit trees and then a small-scale Stonehenge-esque circle of rocks. Among them, a ring of women in translucent bodysuits perform some pagan ceremony, though I believe we're supposed to think they're fully nude. But in this nice high-resolution transfer, you can tell that they're wearing bodysuits. I also love these weird musical interludes that come in. Yeah. Like this, like, kind of like Simon and Garfunkel-esque, like... Yeah, I love all, all the All of music. the songs are amazing. <laughs> Do you guys recall the last time we saw a Stonehenge-like circle of rocks? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, no, I remember. I remember. What do you got? Um, the hell is her name? Tess. There was one in Tess. That was actually mm -hmm. a full-scale recreation of Stonehenge because they couldn't shoot at Stonehenge because yeah. the director was a rapist. Uh, but we've seen one since then, I think. Oh. A Nightmare to Others. Oh, yeah. What's that from? Excalibur. That's right. Completely forgot about was that there, scene. Was there one in, um, oh my God, my brain Thor is not two? working yes. today. Yeah, at the beginning of Thor 2. That might have been the actual Stonehenge, actually. <laughs> I mean, no, it's... the um, Time Bandits. Was there one in Time Bandits? Hmm. I wouldn't put it past them, although maybe you're thinking of Spinal Tap. <laughs> <laughs> The women dance in a circle around a fire pit, occasionally leaping over the flames. The sergeant watches them as he rides a carriage to the nearby castle of Lord Summerisle. The interior of the building is loaded with oil paintings and weapons mounted on the walls. The sergeant watches the women dancing for a moment until he's surprised by Lord Summerisle, who rises from a chair behind him. He's just sitting there the whole time. like He's like, <laughs> how long is this guy just going to watch those naked people jump yeah, around? I should probably, oh, I should have stood up when he came in, and now he's just watching these naked women. I shouldn't. Shouldn't bother him. <laughs> maybe, maybe if I wait a couple seconds, it'll be like a good jump scare. He's here to ask Summerisle's permission to exhume the body of Rowan Morrison for a pathologist's report from the mainland. Summerisle puts up no fight against this request. You suspect uh, foul play? I suspect murder and conspiracy to murder. In that case, you must go ahead. But also, what what is his plan? He He's going to exhume the body now and load it onto the seaplane? Yeah. And then take it to take, take it back. Take it to a pathologist to say, did this person die of like blunt force trauma to the skull, or did they die of what did they die of? Are they ash yeah. in this box? Are they a hair? Mm. <laughs> uh, we'd have to do a hair analysis. Oh, uh, <laughs> at, the, at this point, 
why he hasn't tried to communicate with the mainland. Like, I don't know if he can. That's that's the, that's the whole thing. Is like you're encountering so much resistance, and you clearly know now that they are hiding evidence of a girl who has potentially been murdered. Has at and, least been killed with no explanation yeah. at all. So you should at least report in, right? Yeah, exactly. You should at least report in something. Even if you, you get to... Because I don't know if they would have... You know, spoiler alert. If they if the plane was functional now at this point. Right. Um, but there's clearly... If they have a post office, that means they get regular shipments. Boats yeah. are coming in regular. Yeah, enough. and if he got a letter from the island, then that yeah. means that there's ways to send information in either direction. The sergeant lectures Summerisle on the island's complete lack of a religion, but his lordship corrects that they are devout followers of a different faith. They do love their divinity lessons. But they, they are, are naked. Naturally, it's much too dangerous to jump through the fire with your clothes on. W- what religion can, can, can they possibly be learning? J- jumping over bonfires. Parthenogenesis. By which he means human reproduction without sex. Sergeant Howie declares the faith preposterous and asks how many of these children have ever heard of Jesus, forgetting somehow <laughs> that his own prophet was born of a virgin. Summerisle says he encourages his people to celebrate the living gods and mourn the death of Sergeant's Christian deity. The blasphemy is too much for Sergeant Howie to stomach, and he stands in shock. I love this theme throughout this movie of just... I think, and and um, I don't know if I'm reading into it my own desires, but just like pointing out that Christianity is just as crazy mm-hmm. as well, whatever everyone else is doing. Here. Uh, the 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 studio and filmmakers were a little concerned that this would come off as such a blasphemy. This story that people would side with Summerisle or or be uh, sort of tempted to side with Summerisle in the, in the face of. They they kind of make this inspector look crazy that he's yeah. here as the only defender of Christianity. But when they showed it to church groups and stuff, they were like, "No, this guy's a great Christian. This is a, this is a really wonderful story yeah. to show people." Because they were they had so much faith in in their own belief system that they're like, "No, it's a movie about a guy yeah. being yeah. proven correct and and being wonderful." <laughs> <laughs> is wow. he proven correct? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that remains to be seen. Yeah. Summer Isle explains that his grandfather bought this island and founded this village and religion. The volcanic soil and temperate climate allowed for the farming of new exotic fruits with which the island could provide for themselves. The success of the fruits was all the proof needed for his first generation of followers that the gods were smiling upon them. Samurai's father continued the tradition, but with a genuine love of the people with whom he shared the island, and he brought up Lord Samurai in the same way. All this is coming out while they're walking the grounds together. Yeah. And all the while, Christopher Lee is giving him food to eat. Right. It's just like, what are you doing? Like, He's trying to show them all the cool shit they can make here. But, but it just seems like you're so suspicious of everybody. And here's like the guy who's behind it all offering you literally an apple from the fucking yeah. tree. And you're just <laughs> eating it up. Oh, this is really good. Good job, sir. He brought me up. He brought you up to be a pagan. A heathen, conceivably, but not, I hope, an unenlightened. The sergeant asks again for permission to exhume Rowan, and Summerisle reminds him that, I already said fine, (laughs) and oh look, here's your carriage to leave. That night, the groundskeeper and sergeant dig up and crack open the girl's coffin and are disturbed to find a rabbit inside. Those are hairs. Sorry, a hair. He's disturbed. Yeah, the groundskeeper groundskeeper seems like, like, yeah, yeah. that's part of the prank. I'm glad I got to see your face. Weirdly, in the six or seven months that it spent underground, the rabbit hasn't decomposed at all. But maybe it wouldn't in an airtight coffin, or maybe they swapped it out recently. I, don't I was going to say, I also don't think it's been there for six yeah. or seven months. I don't know. The sergeant storms into Summer Isle's castle while he's performing music in the den with a woman. He tosses the corpse of a hare into a fluffy-looking animal skin rug. I found that in Rowan Morrison's grave. Rather than be disturbed by the dead hair soiling the room, they seem to imply that the girl's body transmogrified into this creature, and the sergeant's patience is wearing thin. Also, man, the dedication that he took this dead rabbit- He walked the whole way All the way back to Summer (laughs) Isle's castle. It's like when Adam Sandler shows up with the phone with the cord hanging off of it and punch drunk love. (laughs) It's like, how long did you walk like that? Summer Isle reminds Sergeant Howie that he is a detective, and if the child is missing again, it's his job to find her. (laughs) The sergeant finally spells out his suspicion of what has happened here. I think Rowan Morrison was murdered. 
under circumstances of pagan barbarity, which I can scarcely bring myself to believe as taking place in the 20th century. He will waste no further time on the island and intends to head home now to report his findings to the higher-ups. This is what's called overplaying your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Lord Samurail employs a bit of reverse psychology and endorses the sergeant's decision to leave before their May Day celebration tomorrow. It would surely offend him too much to see it. Insanely, the sergeant decides to stay another night, and after hours, he breaks into the foreskin shop to search the back room <laughs> for a copy of the missing Harvest Festival photograph. Excuse me, do you have a couple ounces of foreskin? <laughs> Trying to turn my daughter into a were-rabbit. Four for a dollar. Four for four. Wow. Four fours for four. <laughs> he locates a negative of the photo from the 1972 picture and places it in a downshooter to develop a print. So he knows how to fly a plane and develop yeah, photographs. I, well, I was like, okay, hold on. <laughs> At, you and I took a film development class together. And I still don't fucking know how yeah, to do it. Yeah, there's no <laughs> way I could remember how to do it. I, I knew, can do it. <laughs> yeah, you think you could do it? Yeah. I was just like... What is this? What is his job that he flies planes? He is literally the character from Hot Fuzz. That yeah. he, he has like all of these unusual skill sets. First, you pour in the developer and then you stir it with a foreskin for a while <laughs> as a stopper. Natural stopper, they call it. The girl, as suspected, was Rowan this year. And although she smiles, the same empty apple baskets are piled around her, implying a failed crop. Presumably, the girl paid a price for this failure. As he tries to sleep that night, he's frustrated by Willow, the innkeeper's daughter, pounding on the wall between their rooms. She's dancing naked in her own room and calls to him in song. Eventually, he rises and walks to his door. Supposedly, this scene took 13 hours to film, but I have to assume that they would have gotten it much faster if it didn't involve a nude and gyrating woman. <laughs> Eklund only portrays the character from the waist up, but the full body dancing was done by multiple stand-ins, and we'll discuss more of that controversy at the end. Upon learning of the scene in question, Eklund's boyfriend at the time, singer Rod Stewart, allegedly made some attempt to block the film's release, including trying to buy it himself. But she has said that Rod Stewart was actually extremely tight with his money and never would have spent his money on something ridiculous like that, so that might just be a rumor that people spread. The sergeant manages to regain control of himself before opening the door and then finds himself drawn to the wall as she dances on the opposite side. He wrestles his way back to bed and in the morning she brings him coffee. She voices her disappointment that he didn't answer her song last night and he admits that he's engaged and it was nothing personal. She warns him a second time that he should leave before the May Day celebration since he will certainly not enjoy it. At a local library, the sergeant reads up on ancient May Day festivals for some idea of what might happen here today. He educates himself on the various costumed characters expected to populate these festivals historically. In ancient festivals, the celebrations would culminate in sacrifices to the gods as a payment for next year's harvest. It occurs to the sergeant that the girl might not be dead and might be intended as this year's sacrifice. So I feel like this is the leap that he needs to make for everything else to sort of fall in place, but I don't feel like they helped him quite get mm -hmm. to this leap. Yeah. So that's the only part that I'm like, how would they ensure that he would start to think that she might not be dead. Yeah. I feel like this should have been a reason to definitely not leave the island also. If you think that the girl's here and alive and that they're lying to you about her being dead and that they plan on sacrificing someone today, that now would be the worst time to leave, right? right. If they're planning on sacrificing her later this afternoon and yet he goes straight to the plane from this moment. Well, maybe for backup. I just feel like they, they could have flipped these scenes around a little bit. Like he goes to the plane and we see when he gets there that he gets a dinghy ride out to the plane and it turns out the plane is no longer in working condition. And the harbor master stands on the shore as villagers are like peeking up looking at him wearing fox masks and march hare masks. And, uh, and then he asks for the dinghy to come back because he's like, I can't start this plane. And that's when I would have expected him to go to like confused by the masks, go to the library and realize this right. girl's still alive and decide to stay here officially. As the sergeant walks angrily through town, he snatches glimpses of the characters he saw in the library book that will march in today's celebration. As often as he sees these costumed characters, they disappear around corners, and he can't keep up, even though he's an unladen policeman, and the costume looks like a giant tent around this man's waist. He can't be going very fast in it. And he's obviously leading you somewhere. He's like hanging around for you to notice him and then running. He follows the tented costume to a courtyard where everyone seems to be gathering, including Lord Summerisle. The man in the punch 
the fool costume, is the innkeeper. Punch is also not a traditional pagan character, as the library book suggested, but half of the famed Punch and Judy comedy duo adapted themselves from the Italian Commedia dell'arte character of Pulcinella. But I would assume that it, there would be maybe some sort of fool or gesture. Sure, yeah. But and, 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 and Punch is a, a jester, right? Right, but this design is very clearly the same as the Punch like hand puppet. Sure, design. sure, sure. Yeah. But it but it's still representing, you know a jester like you'd see on, on like a tarot card almost. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Samurile announces to the gathered villagers that they will offer a sacrifice to their sun god Nuwata at the end of this year's procession. The sergeant races to the post office to inform May Morrison that her daughter is likely alive and due for sacrifice this afternoon. He begs for her intervention, but she warns him against involving himself. He promises to find the girl with or without her help. The search is a frustrating one because the townspeople are uncooperative and many of these homes have secret passageways that keep leading him to dolls posed in place of children as a goof. In one house, he stumbles upon a woman bathing nude and apologizes before backing away. At another house, he opens a closet and a young girl's body tumbles out, but then she gets up laughing, having successfully pranked the sergeant. Again, like, I feel like this is pretty elaborate to get the whole town to be like, okay, take You're some dolls hide and hide, hide them mm -hmm. around. Little girl, stand here for the next three hours just right. in case. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really want the I really wanted the twist of this whole thing to be that the only weird thing that they do is is practice the religion. Like the the umbilical cord, all that stuff was like just fake just for just for the freak him out. Just to freak him out. Like they don't actually do any of yeah. this stuff. <laughs> like that was just bacon. That wasn't a naval string. Outside, he notices another ship in the harbor and inspects the whole thing fruitlessly. <laughs> Why not take this ship and yeah, leave? <laughs> geez. He peeks in on a bakery where a man is pulling out an enormous steel coffin from the oven and then reveals a loaf of bread in the shape of a corpse inside. This inspires him to check the local coffin shop, and the second <laughs> box he opens contains a deceased old woman with silver dollars on her eyes and one missing hand. <laughs> and we might see this hand later. I'm not sure. I think we, I think we do. <laughs> Exhausted and annoyed, the sergeant returns to his room at the inn for a nap in the middle of the day. <laughs> yeah, what are you still, doing? There's still a missing girl who's about to be sacrificed. This isn't a different fucking time zone, dude. <laughs> keep looking. Please, you said you were going to keep looking. Please work as hard. I need a nap. Oh, boy. I could take some, catch some Zs, and then I'll catch some criminals. He lays in bed with his eyes closed and overhears a conversation between the innkeeper and his daughter, Willow. They seem to be planning something for him, very loudly, like <laughs> 10 feet away. Willow lights something with a match that she expects will help the sergeant to sleep. When the girl and her father have gone, he opens his eyes and finds a candle in the shape of a human hand with five <laughs> flaming fingers on his nightstand. Is this a real hand or is this a candle designed to look like a hand? I yes. think it's a real hand. <laughs> yes, it's the correct answer. <laughs> it is definitely one of those two. Uh, what I like is the conversation is so ambiguous that you think it's like, oh, they're going to poison him or inject him yeah. Yeah. or they put something in his in his food. It's like... <laughs> It's like, no, it no, the apples. <laughs> it's the old flaming hand <laughs> trick. And I don't even know what this was supposed to do because clearly it's not like, it's not releasing fumes into the room because right. he woke up immediately and threw it on the floor. And then he takes the candle stand down the hall and he knocks the father unconscious before trading into his punch costume. We cut to the procession moving down the road and the sergeant's half-assed improv dancing is disappointing Lord Summerisle. What's the matter with you, McGregor? Do you call that dancing? Cut some capers, man. Use your platter. Luckily for the sergeant, Summer Isle assumes that the innkeeper is just drunk off his own ales. Obviously, Edward Woodward is not visible in the costume, so screenwriter Anthony Schaefer's brother Peter stood in to do most of this aimless marching for him. The parade comes to a field where girls try to fight the sergeant's fool character and show him their butts for spanking. Not their bare butts, but they just turn their butts at him. As they near the end of the parade route, they encircle the mini Stonehenge, and the sergeant notices someone wrapped entirely in a hare's costume. It's clear he suspects that Rowan is trapped inside. A group of kilted swordsmen in the center of the stone circle form a Star of David with their six blades, and one at a time, the people from town peek their heads through the hexagon of swords in the center, and even the sergeant takes his turn. When the girl in the hare costume puts her head through, the swords all slice it at once and cleave the rabbit's head from its shoulders. Everyone is shocked for a moment until a young girl named Holly emerges, 
tucked safely below the shoulders of the costume. Everyone laughs like this was planned, and maybe it was. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. But they also acted shocked. Yeah. I don't but know. What's that's happening. part of the game. Yeah. See, uh, like, like again, I, I had, well, I should point out, I'd never seen this movie before. Oh, really? Okay. Um, and so I, I was like, I was really hoping that the twist, part of the twist, was going to be like, yeah, th- th- this is all like we don't actually kill people for the religion. Right. Like you're crazy. If you think that we just, we do the old things, but it's not, we don't go that far. Yeah. So like you thought we were going to cut someone's head off because that's what the ritual calls for. But it's like, no, no, we just pretend. We we emulate that. Yeah. Yeah. The whole town marches to the beach where large barrels are being donated to the God of the sea. Samurai bashes them open with an ax before they're rolled into the surf. Do you guys remember the last time we saw a huge container dumped into the ocean as a supposed offering to the gods? It was a foreign film. Godzilla? The... But that's the right country. Bushido Blade? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think you've oh. covered two of our three Japanese <laughs> La- films. Lady Snowblood. <laughs> oh, no, not Lady Snowblood either. <laughs> uh, the Lone Wolf and Cub? Nope. <laughs> Kagemusha? There you go. <laughs> the cover whole... story for Shinjin's Burial at Sea was that they donated sake to the god mm. instead of a corpse. Oh, I thought this was sake, but thanks, guys. <laughs> if you drink the Shinjin at the bottom, you have crazy dreams. <laughs> That's them talking to the god. Once the barrels have been loosed into the waves, Samurai admits the time for human sacrifices upon them. Everyone turns to face the caves along the beach, and Rowan steps out at the top of a stone stairway. These caves are actually the Wookiee Hole Caves in Somerset, and have become a tourist attraction. Still in costume, the sergeant races up to the girl. Summerall's assistant, Broom, still assuming this is McGregor, asks him what's wrong, and the sergeant punches the man unconscious. This is like (laughs) you get little vibes of the Nicolas Cage version of the story. (laughs) He moves to untie Rowan, and it seems that she's not cool with being made a sacrifice today. Hurry, Mr. Please! I don't like it here! They're coming! Do you know what they're going to do? I know what they're going to do. Come on, hurry, hurry, hurry! He leads the girl back through the caves, and she claims to know a way out. The sergeant frisbees a wreath of flowers off the girl's head into a nearby pond to throw the men chasing them off their scent. The sergeant and Rowan emerge from a hole at the top of the rocks and are met here by Summerisle and Willow. Rowan runs willingly to her lord, seeking his approval. Did I do it right? You did it beautifully! Dear little Rowan. Turns out they knew this whole time that he'd replaced McGregor, and this girl's job was to lead the sergeant into a trap. Presumably, he was always the intended sacrifice, and they wrote him the letter, hoping that an authority from the mainland would make a more appealing sacrifice to their gods. Yeah, like, he went through the list of all the things. It's like, he checks all the boxes for a good sacrifice. It's yep. like, he's, he's the perfect... How did they find him? Like, <laughs> yeah, how did they pick him, of all people? Yeah. Uh, did they have people on the mainland just scouring, looking for the like the perfect sacrifice? I think they what? needed... They were like, we need a cop who's a virgin. And they were like, "That this is the one. This is the only <laughs> the one. Only one. <laughs> it is our most earnest belief that the best way of preventing this is to offer to our God of the Sun and to the Goddess of our orchards the most acceptable sacrifice that lies in our power. Animals are fine, but their acceptability is limited. A little child is even better, but not nearly as effective as the right kind of adult. What do you mean? right kind of adult you sergeant are the right kind of adult as our painstaking researches have revealed you uniquely were the one we need a man who would come here of his own free will a man who has come here with the power of a king by representing the law a man who would come here as a virgin a man who has come here as a fool Somehow the sergeant still believes he can return home freely, despite the sudden appearance of every single person in town. He announces again his undying faith in a Christian god and the resurrection. And even if you kill me now, it is I who will live again. Not your damned apples. Yeah, he he really gets on a high horse here at the end of like, he's like, don't you see there are no old gods? There's just the one god. It's like... You're not winning us over, dude. (laughs) It's like you're doing the same thing, man. The sergeant's clothes are torn off of him, and the women brush his skin with their hair. They wash his hands and paint his chest and dress him in a robe. 
He uselessly shouts his Christian beliefs at these people, I guess in the hopes that a sudden lightning storm will spare him. Otherwise, it's just a weird move. I believe in the life eternal, as promised to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Summerisle congratulates him on a true martyr's death, and the titular Wicker Man is finally introduced. Oh God! Oh Jesus Christ! Before he is sacrificed, he tries again to plead with the crowd to admit what they're doing here is murder. Well, don't you see that killing me is not going to bring back your apples? Summerisle, you know it won't. Well, go on, man, tell them, tell them it won't! I know it will. Which is the line that most closely mirrors my recollections of the Nicolas Cage remake before having rewatched it now. And you're doing it for nothing! Killing me won't bring back your goddamn honey! But I know it will. He asks if they intend to go on killing people every year that their trees don't blossom, and suggests next year they sacrifice Summerisle in the event of another failed crop, but Summerisle insists that won't come to pass. The villagers lift the sergeant off the ground and drag him to an enormous wooden structure in the shape of a man. The sergeant is led up the steps into the belly of the wicker man. Pretty sure he could punch his way out of this. <laughs> yeah, it seems pretty flimsy, actually. Yeah. He doesn't try for very long. I don't, yeah, wicker isn't known for yeah. his strength. <laughs> yeah, it's known for me accidentally kicking through it when I'm trying to clean my room. <laughs> what? <laughs> Thanks, wicker hamper. <laughs> That's why I set it on fire, sweetie. <laughs> also, there was a sergeant in there. <laughs> I want better apples in this house. The sergeant screams inside the statue, which is also loaded with various live animal sacrifices. Cows, chickens, pigs, ducks. Apparently there was a goat right above him that pees on him while he's screaming. Oh, no. <laughs> Did you intentionally no. make a goat voice as you said that? <laughs> oh, so no. Mad Mardigan. <laughs> <laughs> Lord Summerisle prays to the setting sun. The sergeant tries to convince them that the one true God has damned them with a fruitless year for their blasphemy. No one seems moved by his sermon, and a team of torchbearers light the timber at the feet of the wicker man. Because they had all those other fruitful years with their blasphemy. So yeah, why it did you... happen so many years. This is the third generation of these settlers, and every year they had apples. So I don't blame them. The flames quickly grow, and the village sings. So The sergeant launches into a rival church song, The Lord's My Shepherd, again. I feel like in this position I would be kicking the statue apart mm -hmm. or hoping for the fire to weaken the structure before the flames killed me. Yeah. But he seems to be choking on the smoke before it can do any of that. Just, like, start rocking it back That's and That's what forth, I would think because, you know, you know uh, wicker f fuel melts <laughs> wicker beams. <laughs> you can just <laughs> rock this thing over. And try to rock it towards them so it falls. <laughs> so you can kill them all. <laughs> Take them out. <laughs> back to Bushido Blade where you just drop the, the entire lighthouse on the guys. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the flames snuff out the sergeant's screams and the wicker man collapses in a heap of flame atop the cliffs over the ocean. The camera pushes past the collapsing wicker man to zoom into the sun, setting behind the ocean, and the credits roll. Such an amazing shot. They thought they were going to have to do blue screen for this because they're like, we're not going to get the timing right of this wicker man collapsing and then be able to push past that into the sun as it's touching the top of the ocean. And it just worked out beautifully. Wow. So that's the wicker man. I love it. I had also never actually seen this one before. It is now one of my favorite movies. This was amazing. Yeah, I... I as, I really like it because I hate the protagonist so much. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And, and so when he, when, at the end, I'm just like, yeah, yeah, fine. That's great. Good. Thank that you, guys. So yeah. Thanks for taking care of that. I hope you get your apples next year. <laughs> like, there was a, I had a, I had a note, um, it, like, when they were, like, marching, uh, all dancing, and it was like, this all seems like really good fun. Where can I, where can I yeah. sign up? Yeah. But then when they, when they thought that they chopped the girl's head off, I was like, Oh, okay. okay. Maybe not. But then it was like, she was fine. I was like, okay, it's fun this again. is great. <laughs> yeah. And, and then the they killed the, the man still and on... it's still yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, uh, I, I was trying to describe it to my father. I was like, uh, I, I don't know if I would call it a horror film. I mean, most people call it folk horror. Yeah. Which is the like, same as like, like Midsommar and films but, like that. But those, but those have really horrific things in them. Sure. Yeah. And, like, and 
Christopher Lee was against that from the beginning. He didn't mm. want that to be what this movie was about, gore yeah. and Yeah, cuz like even The Witch and and all those like, right. you know, the uh Eggers movies, uh they're great, but they're really horrific and violent and and disturbing. And this is just more like a slow burn of just like totally being in another world. Yeah. And and it's almost like culture shock of just going to another country right right like you know if we you know i i never been to india but if i went to india obviously i'm, I'm i would like to think that i'm a more learned person who would go oh this culture is amazing but when you see one of their wicker man ceremonies you yeah. would be shocked no but by the burning sergeants but just I, it would seem otherworldly to me yes to see yeah. like their ceremonies i would i would not be like the sergeant and going where you're just like wait all, that's not how we do it what are you doing you're all pagans i'd be, I'd be like i'd be going there in a, in a, in a sort of like like understanding yeah but but i feel like this was like whole thing was just about just culture shock of just within your own country yeah of just like yeah there's probably all kinds of like look at um uh, what was the the freaking um, the movie that Brendan Gleeson and Colin Farrell was Calvary? Like, Cal- no. The, oh, uh, in Bruges. No, no, the the more recent one, the, uh, where they're fighting on the island. I can't remember. Uh, the Banshee. Ir- Irenishi. Ban- yeah, yeah, Banshees of Inisherin. Yeah. yeah, that 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 is dealing with like island life and weird subcultures of island life. Yeah. Um. And so I just took it. I, that's what I was going in, like with this, watching this movie. It's like, yeah, it's weird, and these people have a weird religion, but that's what they do here. Yeah, yeah. And then at the end, it's like, oh shit, mm-hmm. they're taking it one step further than I expected, and that's crazy. But I love it because the horror sets in so instantly when you realize what's going to happen to this guy. I just, I just love all of the religious messaging you know because i think throughout they're talking about how crazy christianity is because they're basically drawing parallels at every yeah. step you're saying this isn't that different from what your people did a long time yeah, ago Yeah, exactly mm-hmm. it's all it's all the same all of these religions are the same and as crazy as you think they are you're just as crazy right yeah i think uh i had not seen this cut of the film before um i think the last time i saw it was probably at the new beverly and I think it was a, a shorter version that didn't have all the uh, the Britt Eklund fully nude dancing stuff in it. Um, but uh, I remember the first time I watched this movie coming home and just being like, that that was epic. Like, that's a movie that I'm mm. going to show people often. I, I just I, Let's just watch it again yeah. right now. <laughs> well, before that, why don't we talk about some of the other stuff that has come after this film. Uh, starting, uh, I guess, with the unproduced sequel, that was written from the same author and the one that I would most like to to sit down to right now, um, but unfortunately does not exist as a film. Uh, it picks up right at the end of this film. As reinforcements from the mainland arrive to find the Wicker Man ablaze, they interrupt the ceremony and manage to rescue Sergeant Howie from the belly of the Wicker Man. What? Yeah. In addition to serious burns, the sergeant and everyone else on the island seems to have aged a couple decades which is later credited to the aborted sacrifice, which was intended to age just Sergeant Howie completely to death. But it's really just a retcon to allow Edward Woodward to reprise the role (laughs) after having aged decades. Howie is hospitalized, but very badly burned. He awakens to the face of his fiance and swears violent revenge on the pagans of Summer Isle. He returns to the island with another officer from his station after he lies to him and says, we have the authority to go back and arrest these people. Upon their return, they find more ceremonies being conducted to make up for the interrupted sacrifice. When he confronts Lord Summerisle and announces his arrest, Summerisle demands a warrant, but the sergeant wasn't actually authorized to come to the island, and he came powered by pure rage. Summerisle challenges the sergeant to a faith off, a demonstration of the powers of their gods. During a challenge of strength, the other cop the sergeant brought back is accidentally decapitated, and the Summerislers bathe in the man's blood. Later, Howie is reunited with older versions of both Rowan and Willow while following clues regarding the locally fabled Lambton Worm. After a late night walk with Willow, who reveals herself to be a demon, and an encounter with one of the island's gods, Howie is attacked by bees, a major antagonist of the Neil LeBute remake. When he gets back to the Green Man that night, a pair of women on horseback offer to take him on a ride with them and talk about the Lambton Worm. He doesn't think they'll all fit on this horse together, so they magically convert it into a stretch horse somehow and <laughs> runs away terrified. <laughs> what? 
In his room, another woman's voice tells him more about the Lambton worm that protects Lord Summerisle here. He hikes to face off against Summerisle at the same seaside cave, but Lord Summerisle comes out riding the Lambton worm, a literal fucking fire-breathing dragon. <laughs> the sergeant manages to slay the worm and tries to arrest Summerisle, but the man says that they're even now. So you arrest can't arrest me. You slay a dragon. All right. Now that that's done, yeah. you're under arrest. And he's like, no, 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 no. Now we're even because I I got your friend decapitated and you killed my worm. So now we're we're fair and square. So now we have to we have for, best of three. We're just going to forget the whole idea that I tried to burn you. Right. Then. Exactly. What? We got to do best of three now. So they face off one last time. Lord Summerisle informs the sergeant of a final test of his faith. They will tie giant eagles to his arms and he will jump off a cliff. And if he dies, then his God is fake. But if the eagles carry him safely, what? then he wins the day. Before the final test, the inspector from the mainland arrives with more police and they urge him to leave with them, but he refuses and he jumps off the cliff. The sacrifice completed, all the people of Summer Isle return to their proper ages. The end. What? That's the sequel that they didn't make. That is bonkers. Yeah. I feel like the Lantern Worm should have maybe been the third one. <laughs> like, maybe you take a, a gentle step into the supernatural realm and then you bring out the dragon. Well, no. and, and I know we're going to get to the Nick Cage one. Yeah. But one of the things that I really like a lot about this movie, although it hints at things being supernatural and magic, nothing actually is. Right. Yeah. There is everything in here is ex is absolutely explained by the fact that the villagers know what is happening right. and are trying to trick this guy. Yeah. M most of the only seemingly supernatural thing is the consistency of the conspiracy. The fact yeah. that they're all able to keep the same story right. and that they keep leading him in the same direction and that mm -hmm. they're able to trick him into going and dressing up as this character and going to the caves. Well, like, I don't think that that is actually like... It, it's it, not it supernatural. It, but it also wasn't necessary. Like they knew that in some way, shape or form, this guy was going to show up to try to save the day and rescue this girl. It didn't right. matter whether or not he was wearing this guy's costume or some other costume or was hiding in the bushes he was going to come out at the time when they needed him to and right. try to rescue this girl they that's knew all they needed to happen steps and that she would lead him away yes so i mean the only thing that they probably sh i mean i don't think that lighting the hand was going to make him sleep anyways but no they i think it was make, just a candle <laughs> they needed to make sure that he did get up and go mm -hmm. attend yeah. this ceremony. Yeah. yeah, that's why they they said it so loudly they down were like, the stairs. I sure hope he doesn't follow us to the ceremony where we <laughs> murder that poor defenseless child <laughs> who sleeps with their door open in their private hotel room. <laughs> like, I call it a handle because it's like a candle, but it looks like a hand. But yeah. handle's already a word, sweetie. <laughs> we should come up with another word for this, but not now. We have a child to murder. The remake. So the biggest differences for the Neil LeBute remake is that the island is mostly women and the few men they do encounter don't speak a single word in the film. Nicolas Cage is the detective renamed Edward Malis and Rowan's last name is changed to Woodward so that both halves of Edward Woodward's name are referenced among the cast. Lord Summerisle is now Sister Summerisle, played by Ellen Burstyn. Most of the pagan imagery has been stripped from the film, except for the titular Wicker Man, and replaced with a motif of bees and hives. Sister Summer Isle's home is surrounded in hives and features many hexagonal accents. The biggest difference is that the detective seeking the girl is not a complete stranger. Instead of having a fiancé at home, she left him in the past and moved to this island. She wrote to him when her daughter went missing, and halfway through the search, he deduces that the girl is in fact his own daughter kept secret all this time. Otherwise, things go very much the same way. The dialogue is yeah. almost word for word. There's a couple of things that I think were good changes or changes that I didn't mind. And then there were things that I was just like, this movie is nowhere near as good as the original. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't actually don't really mind the whole all female island concept that, that you know, that there's this. It's not really a matriarchy, but. I mean, it is a matriarchy, but but I felt like it would have been interesting if they had done it like a beehive where there were all females and there was one male that they were like that's how they reproduce so they they have one person that well, they there isn't just use. one male in right that's what in, i'm saying in that, a beehive though there's multiple males that are drones so th that is what they have right but what i'm saying is in a hive there's only one queen 
So I'm saying this would be a reverse of of a hive. Okay. Where the que- where the queens, the women on this island, are the drones of this society, and they have one, a king, that they reproduce with. Well, regardless, I think that I I think that's an interesting idea to explore. Um, so I don't mind that change. Uh, I do like the fact that they dropped the whole idea of the, that that this you know middle aged man needed to be a virgin. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And also, he's, like, not shocked at all by anything that happens on the island. He's just kind of like, oh, that's funny. You're teaching him about dicks in school. <laughs> like, he doesn't give a shit. He's like, wow, school's really changed. Yeah. And I like that at the end, they actually incapacitate him. So right. he can't yeah. escape the Wicker Man. Mm. They break his legs, which I'm like, okay, good. That makes sense. Um, but I had actually seen this one, mm-hmm. which is why I was so shocked when I saw the original because I was just like, I remember watching the this the Wicker Man with Nick Cage when it came out, and and, and I don't, I don't remember this at all. I don't remember this movie. Like I, this movie is just a totally different movie. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, let's discuss the Wicker Tree. So this just sucked. <laughs> I wish I was less thorough researching the podcast because what an incredible waste of time. <laughs> Cowboys for Christ. An American Christian pop artist brings her fiancé to Europe for a tour. It seems to go well until the local media unveils that before her faith-based music, she sang mostly about being a trailer trash whore and she is shunned by the entire city that she's performing in. Her agent suggests that she perform for a nearby pagan settlement who won't find her past work so blasphemous. But wouldn't they find her current work blasphemous? (laughs) (laughs) I guess not if they don't watch it. Shun the (laughs) (laughs) non-believer. Upon her arrival, some of the women tell her about their May Day festival, and they wrap a fancy dress around her and ask her to be their celebrity guest, the queen of the upcoming celebration. Her fiancé cheats with the first woman he sees in town. When the lead girl stumbles upon a nefarious plan, she tries to escape, but she's knocked unconscious and redressed for the ceremony. When she wakes up, she finds herself in a room with all the previous queens preserved in some way, like taxidermied in their dresses. So she's stuck in a room with all the previous May queens. The rest of the village surrounds her fiancé and salutes him together in gratitude for his sacrifice, and then they all strip him naked and eat him. The girl barely flinches when she learns her fiancé has been eaten in a pagan ritual and goes to face off against the people with the supposed power of Jesus behind her. Like, she's like, oh, it doesn't matter what you guys did to him because Jesus loves me, so I'm going to defeat you. She shoves their leader against the wicker tree, which is just a wicker man but shaped like a tree, and she sets the man on fire, killing him before she is captured. Why would she turn it into a tree? I mean... Like mm-hmm. these it's, are it's already to be, a tree. But yeah, well, it started as a tree. We made then... you a tree out of trees, so you can tree <laughs> while you tree. Thanks, it's exhibit. To be... Yeah, soak the logs in wood. <laughs> it's, it's supposed to be like a, an effigy of a human. I think that's an important part of this. Yeah. <laughs> that's his tree. They say he made it out of a bigger tree. <laughs> the woman her fiancé cheated with gives birth to his child, and we cut forward in time to see the new queen taxidermied in a room full of former festival queens. So we don't actually see what happens to that girl. She, we see them grab her, and then suddenly she's just another statue in the statue room. And that's it. Hmm. She doesn't get burned. They built this whole tree, and then they're like, I guess we'll just make her a statue. Like we did to all the other girls mm-hmm. that we didn't burn. I feel like throughout all these movies, there's a lot of influence in Midsummer. Yeah. it's I, I, I think it's really interesting. Yeah, you it's said there was something about a room full of May Queens. In midsummer, yeah, yeah, they 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 have the wall of pictures just mm-hmm. just like they do in in the Wicker Man movies, and I, I and I'm sure that a lot of the similarities are drawn from the actual, you know, mythology and rituals right. that that would happen around a May Day. But I, I just think it's really interesting because it must have inspired this movie to to be like, okay, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do it a little bit more of a psychological horror with some more gruesome elements in it, right. Our director here was Robin Hardy. This was his first film directing. He followed it 13 years later with The Fantasist and then his final film in 2011, The Wicker Tree. IMDb lists him uncredited as the minister here. The writer here was Anthony Schaefer. He previously wrote the screenplay for Frenzy, which we've covered on the show, and then Sleuth, Murder on the Orient Express, Death on the Nile, and his Wicker Man screenplay is used nearly verbatim for the Neil LeBute 2006 remake. The other writer for the novel, David Pinner, I didn't recognize any of the other adaptations of his work. The music here came from Paul Giovanni. No, not Paul Giamatti. <laughs> Paul Giovanni. He is drinking some fucking Merlot. <laughs> what? 
He appears in the film performing his own music with the band Magnet. Magnet was actually Giovanni's second choice for the band after Pentangle. You guys recall the last time we mentioned the word Pentangle on the show? Excalibur? Mm. <laughs> pentangle. It was a- oh, because it's not a quad. It was a pentagon. No, I don't remember. It was uh, <laughs> there was a pentangle on the wall of a bar. Oh, was it um, in the um, American Werewolf in London? That's right. But what what were we watching? Where you were complaining that it wasn't a quad because it was shaped differently? I don't know. I'm always mad about quads. That the quad wasn't a quad, and it was a was it a pentagon? I don't remember what shape <laughs> it was. I don't remember. But the film's musical director, Gary Carpenter, assured Giovanni that his personal band, Magnet, would be better and cheaper. So he's like, don't go with Pentangle, go with my band. Mm -hmm. We're the good one. (laughs) Giovanni's only credit outside this film was for a play adapted into the 1991 TV movie, Crucifer of Blood. Crucifer. So it's like Crucible meets Lucifer. Crucifer of Blood. (laughs) I really wanted somebody to name their child Crucifer. <laughs> <laughs> just, I just read it one day. At the time of the production, Giovanni was the boyfriend of screenwriter Anthony Schaefer's twin brother, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> what? So the director's twin brother was dating this guy who is the lead singer of the band okay. in the movie and wrote all the music for it. Um, he's also, Peter is the same one who was playing the fool during the parade sequences uh, right. of the film. But Peter is a celebrated screenwriter. He wrote the plays that were adapted into Equus and Amadeus, and he actually wrote the screenplay for Amadeus, too. The cinematographer here was Harry Waxman. He was the DP on the 1960 Swiss Family Robinson and The Pink Panther Strikes Again. The editor was Eric Boyd Perkins. So far on the show, he has cut Hawk the Slayer, and he later cut Giovanni's Crucifer of Blood TV movie. Edward Woodward played Sergeant Howie at the time he was best known for playing the titular Callan, for four seasons of the BBC Spy series. We've seen him so far as Breaker Morant in Breaker Morant. Later, he appears as the Ghost of Christmas Present in George C. Scott's Christmas Carol TV movie, but he's likely best known for Robert McCall, the titular character in 88 episodes of The Equalizer, which he landed when American television producers found him in this film. In a clear reference to this film, he appears again as Tom Weaver in Edgar Wright's Hot Fuzz. He's the leader Mm -hmm. of the Neighborhood Watch who's keeping an eye and ends up being sort of the the antagonist of the film. Christopher Lee played Lord Summerisle. We saw him last season in one of his classic roles as Dracula for Hammer film Scars of Dracula, one of the four Draculas he played in 1970 alone. We've also seen him in regular episodes as Luckman Skull, the leader of the gay biker gang in Serial, and as the villain of our Chuck Norris title 1981's Eye for an Eye. He's also famously Scaramanga in Bond film The Man with the Golden Gun, Count Dooku, or Dooku, or whatever, in Star Wars. He's Saruman in Lord of the Rings, but he's best known for playing the villainous Sender in John Landis's The Stupids. That's right. Diane Salento played Miss Rose, the teacher. She was Molly Seagram in Tom Jones. She was Edna in ZPG, and she was Hannah Reich in Hitler, The Last Ten Days. At the time of this production, she was also Mrs. Sean Connery, and about 12 years later, she married Anthony Schaefer, the screenwriter of this film. Britt Eklund played Willow, she was Rachel Spittendavel in The Night They Raided Minsky's and Anna in Get Carter. After this, she followed Christopher Lee to The Man with the Golden Gun as Mary Goodnight. We saw her last on the show as the mother in the vampire story segment of The Monster Club. She was also briefly married to Peter Sellers, who famously suffered a heart attack on their wedding night. Technically, the part of Willow is played by five different people. Eklund was uncomfortable appearing fully nude and negotiated the late night dance scene to be mere toplessness, but the filmmakers hired body doubles in secret to dance for full body inserts. The more spastic dancing we see was performed by Lorraine Peters, a local nightclub dancer, cast on account of her badonkadonk. When Eklund finally saw a cut of the film, she was supremely embarrassed to find a double employed with such an enormous ass compared to her own. Little did she know that in the ensuing years, popular taste would evolve to the point where the doubles' features would be considered a desirable change. Another local girl, Jane Jackson, was also used as a stand-in for the character in various inserts during this same scene. Unhappy with Eklund's speaking voice and attempted Scottish accent, she was dubbed over throughout the film by Annie Ross, and a second voice actress, Rachel Verney, provided the character's singing voice. So she has two body doubles and two voice doubles. Hmm. To this day, Eklund is still approached with stills of her body double, Lorraine Peters, in search of an autograph and has always refused and corrected these requests. I'd also be like, this is super tacky that you did this. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a picture of your ass 
and your face is pointed the opposite direction. Will you sign it for me, please? No. I, I assume she was also voice doubled in Man with the Golden Gun since they always voice doubled every Oh, that Bond makes sense. Girl. Yeah. This is the same woman did the voices of every character for yeah. so long. Ingrid Pitt played the librarian. She's Heidi in Where Eagles Dare. She made appearances in Hammer titles like The Vampire Lovers and Countess Dracula. She reunited with Edward Woodward nine years later for Who Dares Wins, a.k.a. The Final Option, coming up in the next season of our podcast. It's so funny. Uh, Her name came up recently. Uh, A friend of mine was uh, asking me if I wanted any of these books that he was going to be giving away. And one of them was a reference book for horror films Mm. from like... Uh, the dawn of horror to like 1994 when the book was published but the foreword was by Ingrid Pitt oh interesting and I said foreword by Ingrid Pitt I was like I just saw this name somewhere <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay Kemp played Alder McGregor he's also credited as Pantomime Dame in Velvet Goldmine he was only four years older than Eklund playing his daughter in this film Russell Waters played Harbor Master he's Mr. Sanderson in The Heroes of Telemark but not much else I recognized Aubrey Morris played Old Gardener slash Gravedigger. He's Dr. Putnam in Blood from the Mummy's Tomb, adapted from the same Bram Stoker story, Jewel of the Seven Stars, adapted into The Awakening last season. I recognized him best as P.R. Deltoid, Alexander DeLarge's probation officer in A Clockwork Orange. He's also Sir Percy in Life Force, McCutcheon in Bordello of Blood, and more recently he showed up as psychologist Albert Zimmerman in Season 10, Episode 3 of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. He was like... A guy who worked at at a, an asylum where uh, Frank was kept when he was a child or something mm. like that. Roy Boyd played Broom. He was a soldier in A Bridge Too Far and one of the reporters in The Omen. Peter Brewis played Musician. He has mostly composer credits, including on something called Morons from Outer Space from Flash Gordon director Mike Hodges. Jerry Cowper played Rowan Morrison. Not many credits, but she's the twin sister of Jackie Cowper, who plays her photograph in this film. John Hallam played PC McTaggart. That's the other cop who is in the station in the scene that was removed from this version of the film, but he's also the one who gets decapitated in the second story. Mm. Uh, He played Tyrion in Dragon Slayer. That's the guy who kills the wizard at the start of the adventure. He's also Luro in Flash Gordon and Lamson in Life Force and the red-headed Baron in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Leslie Mackey played Daisy. That's the 21-year-old talking about the beetle walking around the the nail in the in the desk in the classroom, and she's the only person to return as a character with the same name for The Wicker Tree, but as an adult. I mean, she was an adult in both films. John Sharp played Dr. Ewan, or Dr. Ewan, <laughs> however you want to pronounce this. Uh, this part was first offered to Patrick Newell, who played Mother in The Avengers. After this, he plays Doolin in Barry Lyndon, and so far on the show we've seen him as Sir Newell's Thud in Fiendish Plot of Dr. Fu Manchu. Later, he's a maitre d' in Top Secret. John Young played Fishmonger. He shows up in Holy Grail and Life of Brian, and we've seen him this season as Reverend Little in Chariots of Fire and Reginald in Time Bandits. I think Little was the name of one of the main characters, so that must be his father because he's Mm. the super religious guy. Um, Yeah, those are all the credits I have for this one. I think that's everything for The Wicker Man. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find all our socials at linktree slash vintage video pod. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us tomorrow when we'll be discussing The Last Detail which IMDb describes like so. Two Navy men are ordered to bring a young offender to prison, but decide to show him one last good time along the way. We leave you now with the trailer for the last detail. What the hell did he do, kill the old man? <laughs> Robbery. How much did he live? Forty dollars. Tried to lift the polio contribution box. Yeah? Polio box is the old man's old lady's favorite do-gooder project. She took it very seriously. Where are we going, Chief? Fortune, naval prison. Good duty for you guys. They're gonna get him there, all right. But first, they gotta take care of a few details along the way. Okay, Baducky. You're the hot job.
jeopardy. He's a prisoner and we're taking him to the jailhouse. And you have a tendency to forget that. You're a menace, man. He's just trying to show the kid a good time, you know what I mean? He can't have a good time. It ain't in him. Let me tell you how it is, Milton. We've got a friend here that we'd like to do a favor for. He's going on a trip. It's just him? Just him. Well, what kind of party after? Now, don't worry about a thing. I'm hustling this guy, you understand? I got him right where I want him. Maybe he's hustling you. Oh, yeah. Maybe he is, but uh, this is not the time to argue about it, because if I don't win, we don't leave New York, eh? <laughs> We're going to a party. Yeah? Could be a big one, eh, Meadows? All we gotta do is get rid of that silly-looking creep there, and we got these three chicks all to ourselves. Doing a man's job. Talking to ships. He looks like a big penguin, don't he? <laughs> Watch out for children! <laughs> He sure is having a good time. Yeah. Sure is, and you said it wasn't in him. Yeah. Huh? All right. <laughs> what do they do in this man's Navy? Everything they can. We'd like to drink a toast to Batman, Superman, and the Human Torch. Ah! <laughs> <laughs>